The whole point is to use what's in your arsenal, use what your strength is, and then figure out ways to deliver and continue to repurpose. Today, I'm very excited to be joined by Amber Figlow. If you don't know who Amber is, she's a content strategist who helps entrepreneurs easily create content to market their businesses. She regularly creates her own content on her YouTube channel focused on content repurposing. Her course is called The Content System. Amber, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? Outstanding. It's awesome to have a content person on the show today. I'm also a content person, so I can't wait to learn from you. Today, Amber and I are going to explore the concept of repurposing your social content, and we're going to get into a cool system. But before we go there, I would love to hear your story. Um, How'd you get into content? Start wherever you want to start. Yeah, so we can kind of take this back kind of far. So uh, just to kind of give everybody some context, I actually started college kind of right after the Great Recession here in America, in case nobody uh, or if there are other people listening outside of the state. 2019, right? This is actually back in 2008. <laughs> That's where we're going to go. Oh, okay. Yep. Oh, that one. Okay, wow. That one. Yes, That's we're going to go back to no, that I one. meant 08. I'm sorry. You're right. 08. Nope. Right. All weird. good. No worries. Yeah. So it was one of those things. I started college and I had always wanted to do something creative. Like I knew I wanted to go into photography or uh, interior design. I really enjoyed that. I did all the arts and crafts as a kid. And then when the recession hit, I was like, I cannot creatively pursue a career. And so I went into college as a pre-med major thinking I'd go into like sports medicine, physical therapy, something like that. And then I was a year in doing chemistry and realized I hated it. And I was like, I have six more years of this. I can't do this. So I actually switched to a business major because I was like, I need to figure out something that's going to give me some stability in a career. And luckily I didn't have to pick a track yet. I was just like, let me switch to business. And I had all these prerequisites and absolutely fell in love with marketing. So that's kind of where my love for content creation marketing started. But again, to paint the picture here, this was back in like 2010 when I was learning all old school marketing tactics. I was learning more print advertising. Luckily I went to a school that really focused on research. So I was able to kind of get the numbers behind marketing. Social media marketing wasn't a thing yet. Um, It was kind of in its foundational stages. So I have really started to develop my career in the social media world post-college. And after college, I was thrown into the deep end, joined a corporate marketing team. We were revenue generating, if that means anything to anybody, um, where basically my marketing activities were directly tied to revenue. So I had a foundation of like always having to prove myself in the marketing world. And, you know, that whole corporate game, I did it for about five years and I learned a lot of valuable lessons, but it was one of those things I was like, I don't want to be tied to numbers. I don't want to be tied to dollars forever in this corporate world. I was on like a 50 person marketing team wow. and again, learned okay. very valuable lessons. Yeah. But I'm just curious, um, what kind of marketing were you doing uh, when you're on that team? Like, yeah, was absolutely. Is what you were saying or was it a corporation? So I actually worked for a large staffing company. So I was just on the internal marketing team there and I was on basically like the sales engagement team. So again, my direct marketing efforts were tied back to dollars, helping them win bids and proposals and presentations and client facing stuff. So again, not the prettiest side of marketing, especially when you're marketing a staffing company. But again, learned a lot of valuable lessons that I was then able to bring into my career along the way. So after leaving corporate, picked up the freelancing, was a solo marketing manager for like a clothing boutique locally. You know, so I did all these small things and started to find my way into the content creation space. Again, I was wor- I was working on that corporate marketing team doing kind of the more boring stuff. And then as I segued into freelance and working with small businesses, I started to find my happy place. And I was like, I love the organic side of content creation, using social media, using blogs as a way to drive traffic back to small business owners so that they can make more money. So that's kind of where I started to find myself. And then back in 2000, it was like end of 2018, early 2019, I just started, I decided to start a creative co as an experiment on Instagram. So that's how my business started. I was like for the next 30 days, I'm going to take this account, a creative co. I just came up with a name and I was like, what can I do in the next 30 days 
and see how far I can get, how many followers I can obtain. And I would report back at the end of every day. I tried this strategy. This is how it worked. This is how many followers I net gained or lost. And I would report back to my followers. And it was a fun experiment. And at the end of 30 days, I had 500 followers on Instagram. And again, that's life-changing to some business owners. And I was like, I'm onto something here with this whole organic content creation. And from there, A Creative Co., I founded a small boutique social media marketing agency. Again, I've done a little bit of everything. And I've recently, over the last year, segued out of that, but again, helped small business owners with their social media marketing over the last four to five years. So tell us what you're doing now. Yes. So I recently transitioned away from my brand, A Creative Co. And now I'm stepping into my personal brand of Amber Figlow as a content strategist. And I focus more on the workflows and strategy behind content creation instead of doing it for small business owners. I help small business owners really set up the foundations they need to execute on their own or with a team with a little bit of help. Very cool. So you have basically taken all the things that you've learned since college and after college. And it's fascinating because, you know, back in 2010, uh, Social Media Examiner was one years old. And yes. um, it was kind of the wild, wild west back then. And I remember there weren't very many universities teaching and they started coming to a lot of university professors started coming to our conference, Social Media Marketing World, to kind of figure out what their course curriculum was going to be, you know, in like 2013, 14, 15, 16, and yep. even up up into the presence. And it's just constantly changing. And I'm excited that you've taken all this experience and you're going now to establish yourself as a thought leader. And you're going to be practicing, obviously, what you're preaching, which I'm super excited about. So um, there are going to be some people listening right now who are, they understand conceptually the, 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 the repurposing, right? We've had a fair amount of people on the show to talk about um, repurposing, but there are going to be some people who are like, well, I don't really know if that's wise, because all the algorithms are so different. So what do you want to say to people about the importance of repurposing content across the various social platforms? Absolutely. So I like to give a quick anecdote. And the way that I like to approach this when I'm thinking about content repurposing, a lot of people think of it in terms of I need to post this TikTok and repost it on Reels. And I'm like, it can get even simpler, but more complex at the same time. So to put this in perspective, when you, let's say you're a teacher, you have a core curriculum that you teach year in and year out. You have these foundational lessons, and then you find new ways to present them to students. You do a new activity. You do a new lab. And that's the way that I actually approach content repurposing. We have our core content curriculum, if you will. We have our core messaging. And then I find new ways to repurpose that content on new platforms, present it in new ways. So my approach to content repurposing is a little bit different. And of course, we'll dive into that in a bit. And that way, you're making sure that you're delivering the same message, delivering the same value, but giving it to your audience in new and different ways. So we cannot, we, we're, we're going to dive into that one today. Well, and the other side of, I think, why it's so important to consider repurposing is because there's only so many hours we have in the day as marketers or creators or entrepreneurs, right? And you could find yourself spending an outlandish amount of time creating something unique for every one of the social platforms and um, burn out, right? And the benefit of content repurposing, I think, is to at least hopefully... Um, um, do like you said, like create something and then slightly modify it here and there in order to not burn out and take advantage of what the algorithms uh, can do with that content. So let's start at a high level with uh, what your strategy is, and then we're going to dig into it a little bit here. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm so glad you brought that up because my whole thing with content repurposing is, yes, saving time. Let's be more efficient. Um, but yeah, so the approach that I have inside of my course, the content system, going to give you a high level overview here. A lot of the times it's referred to as a hero content strategy. And essentially what this means is we're taking some form of long form content. So something that has some depth, something that has some breadth, something that is a bit longer than your average, you know, tweet or something. Something, I'm so sorry, whatever you post on X now. <laughs> you know, so it's something I still call it tweets, so I, I don't know what else to call it. We'll call it posts, I guess. A post on X, or it's something that's a little bit longer than a reel. So I take that long form piece of content and we break it down in 
multiple different ways for one business owner. Maybe it's five pieces of content. For me, it's over 15. And I figure out how to disperse that message, that topic across these platforms in different ways with one core foundation of long form content. I love this concept because um, for those that are listening, you might not realize it, but this podcast kind of does what Amber's talking about, right? Like we're recording this in video um, and we plan to publish an edited version of this on YouTube. We plan to publish the audio version of it across all the platforms. And then we plan to write an article out of this, right? And publish it on Social Media Examiner. And um, that's what I love about what you're talking about is this this strategy, I think, um, allows you to get way more creative, right? Because you can use your time to essentially figure out how to use what pieces of it in various places instead of saying, all right, what's my strategy for YouTube? What's my strategy for podcasts? What's my strategy for blogging, right? Correct. And it gives you the ability to show up in multiple places because that's, you know, eventually the goal for certain marketers, for certain small business owners is to show up in more places, but it also people consume content in different ways. I am the kind of person, I like listening to things on like two times speed. I don't have the time in the day to sit there and watch a ton of content. I'm like, let me speed this up. So I love a YouTube. I love a podcast where somebody that maybe is a mom and she has children around, she can't listen to things. Maybe she likes to read articles. Mm -hmm. So you're also giving people the freedom to choose how they're going to consume your content, which I think is so important. We all like to learn in different ways. Okay, so um, let's dive into the first part of your process. Yeah, absolutely. So I am a huge fan of batching content. So the first part here actually requires you to batch create your long form content. Now, when I teach the strategy, obviously, I'm going to talk first and foremost about YouTube, but it can be other pieces of content. Uh, it can be a podcast. It can be a video podcast. It can also be, let's say you like going live on Instagram for 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, you know, you can use whatever long form piece of content you want, but for context and to keep this high level, we're just going to talk about YouTube. Um, and that's my preferred methodology here. So the first thing I like to do each and every month, I sit down to batch create next month's content. So let's say it's October 1st, I am batching YouTube videos for November. And then making sure depending upon the number of weeks in the month, uh, I like to post YouTube videos on Mondays. So it's between four to five videos that I'm sitting down and creating all at once. And again, the thought process behind this is once you're in the mindset, once you're in the mood of creating content, sometimes it's really hard to get over that initial like five minutes of like, okay, I got to get on camera, this, that, and the other, but you're an hour or two into creating your content and you are in a flow. You are in a state of mind where like, I am showing up on video right now and I can use it for the next month. You show up that one day and then you just get to, again, we'll get into the next part of the process, but showing up that one day allows you to create content for the next month. I love this idea of like recording everything in a day. Like I record I do a bunch of stuff and um, I do videos that are like seven to 10 minutes long and I record them on the weekend. I just do one a week and I'm a month in advance, but I, I record them. I don't even know what I'm going to talk about until I go into it. Right. So there's not a lot of thought to what I'm doing other than I know there's topics that I've outlined that I want to talk about. The idea of getting an entire month banged out in a day is super, super attractive. So, um, but some people might find that a little bit challenging. So any thoughts on how to maybe simplify that a little bit? Yeah, so I have a couple of things for the audience here. Um, first and foremost, I know the thought of batching all at once seems overwhelming. And the way that I approach it, um, you know, just to provide context, sometimes I'm, I'm also a person who loves to... Um, I pre-make all my meals for the week. So Sunday evenings, I am cooking. And so that's a form of batching. That's why I always tell people, think about the things that you're doing in, in your life. I promise you, some of the women might resonate with this in the audience. Sometimes we take an everything shower, we're washing our hair, we're doing literally everything in that one shower. That's batching. So, you know, it always feels like a struggle to show up and batch create content, but I promise you, you're doing it in other ways in your life. And you have to think about the end goal here. You probably sit down 30 minutes in the morning and you're batch writing your emails. You're responding to emails every morning. So you have to think about it in this is an activity I need to do for my business. And by batch creating it and batch creating these videos, I am saving myself time in the long run. And then 
we can dive into this too, is I actually have a formula and an approach to batch creating these YouTube videos. So yeah, let's, ready, let's yeah. talk about it. Um, let's talk about it. Now, one question I've got for you is the um, what we're about to talk about and filming all done in one day, or is the preparation for the filming done leading up to one day? That's what I'm curious about. Yeah, absolutely. This is where I let people kind of choose. This is where I am the kind of person I cannot write and record in the same day. So when I when I script my YouTube videos and I use the word script loosely, for me, it's more of an outline. I like to the previous day or maybe the week before I like to script. I like to outline because that's just where my brain is. But for some people, and again, the scripting outline process might take an hour or two. And then when I sit down to record though, it takes me another hour or two. So again, I keep this a very, very refined process. So you can, if you're the kind of person that you can switch your brain on and off, feel free to script an outline in the morning and then in the afternoon you can batch record. That's totally up to you. Um, but the way that I like to approach this is I get up first thing in the morning. I, you know, since I, I do like to do my hair and makeup for my YouTube videos, that's first and foremost do my little morning routine. And then I sit down at my desk at 9 a.m. with the intention of I have until noon to get all these videos done. I you know, sit down and I record all the YouTube videos. I take pictures for the thumbnails. I create any supplemental content. Like we can dive into that. But I have the idea of like, I have this time. And this is what I always tell people is, Give yourself those three hours, give yourself those four hours and you'll get it done. But if you say, I'm just going to batch create, you know, for the full day, we'll see how far I get. No, start with the mindset of you're going to batch record four to five videos. And I promise you, you're going to get them done. Um, so that's the way I like to approach it there. Well, yeah. And let's talk about kind of the structure of how you do the videos as well. And by the way, I, I think it must be, feel so liberating to know I just got a month's worth of content done when you're done with those four hours. How does that feel? Oh, it's so great. And another just quick little tip is I always make sure the afternoon, very light work, very light tasks. Cause I, I'm not going to lie to you as much as I love batching, it is energy draining. So I make sure I just have like admin tasks or maybe I'll schedule an appointment for later in the day. Cause I'm like, I don't have enough brain power to go be creative afterwards. But yeah, so I approach this video and remember the whole point of this strategy is to save your time and so that you can repurpose this full length YouTube video. So I approach the scripting process in a unique way. I don't expect you to go out and create 30 minute vlogs. Like that's not my approach here. I do primarily focus on content, especially for this system is you're educating your audience on some particular topic. So the way I approach the outline, the way I approach the script is that I have a very quick intro just to hook the audience in 30 seconds or less. Then I have three main talking points. And then I have an outro that provides a call to action to watch another video, to download a freebie, to do X, Y, and Z. And the reason why I approach it in this way is I know that I at least have three different um, points that I can turn into content elsewhere. Those three points can turn into three different reels. Then within those three points, maybe I can create more TikTok videos. Like I approach this with a very formulaic uh, way of doing things because I know it's going to make it so much easier to repurpose in the long run. Can you give a hypothetical or a real example of, of how this might look? And, and before you do, how long are your typical videos that you're creating on YouTube? Yeah. So I've been testing around with quite a few different lengths of videos, but my sweet spot is anywhere between eight and 12 minutes. I find that that is, it helps keep the, the audience engaged while also making sure I have enough time that eight to 12 minute video with pauses and things like that take me maybe 15 to 20 minutes to record. So again, really condensing that timeline on my batch recording day, because I don't have time to create four 30 minute vlogs every single month, you know? So a quick little outline here that, you know, I like to run through recently. I just did one, the one that I posted yesterday, it was don't get scammed by social media, quote unquote experts. And I gave three different things that I see social media experts talking about online that I want to debunk. So I gave those three things like one, for an example, my first one was content pillars are dead. Like I hear that a lot and I'm like, no, content pillars aren't dead. And then I go into a two, two other ones. And that way I can turn that YouTube video into so many other things, but that's just kind of a quick little example there. So when you're recording this, um, if you know, you're going to be, um, if you know, you're going to be ultimately dividing this up into smaller pieces of content, 
Is there anything else you need to do? Like, what about creating intros for the smaller versions that you're going to be creating? Um, or you understand where I'm going with that? Like, like sometimes people that I get on the show that are short form video experts have some sort of a little something at the beginning of the video that's like a teaser. Mm -hmm. Is that somehow part of this process, but you don't put it in the YouTube video? So for me, it looks a little bit different. So let's say, let's go back to my outline. So obviously we have intro, outro, no brainer. That's pretty typical for most YouTube videos. Now those three points in the middle, um, what I like to do inside of my outline is I'll have three bullet points underneath each of those three main topics so that that kind of guides me into a hook that guides me into something. So for instance, with the content pillars are dead, we're just going to go back to that example there. Um, I'd have three bullet points underneath of talking points. So I'd say content pillars aren't dead because of X, Y, and Z. That would be a bullet point underneath that topic. Then I would dive into saying something like, if you're struggling with creating content pillars, dot, 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 that's my next talking point. And you see how like you can kind of I start to create these smaller pieces of content as I am scripting. So it just makes it so much easier. I don't worry about these like intros, outros, hooks. I'm like, I already know I'm saying and I'm dropping gems in the YouTube video that I know I can clip down. Like as I'm recording, I'm like, oh, that's going to be a great uh, piece of content on threads. That's going to be a great TikTok video. So I go into it while I'm scripting, while I'm outlining with the end goal in mind. And it just helps the words flow a little bit better. Okay, before we get to your next step, um, there are going to be some people who are like, okay, uh, I feel like I'm a little more extemporaneous where I just want a bullet point and I talk versus I need a script. Like, what do you recommend? Because um, I would imagine sometimes not everybody can read and not sound like they're reading. So have you, how have you trained up other people on how to overcome this, if you will? Yeah. So I'm actually a big fan of not scripting every single word. I like to give myself again, maybe sometimes I'll give a couple words of a hook or I'm like, oh, talk about this anecdote, talk about this story. But I am the kind of person I sound so much better and more authentic if I'm not reading from a script. And that's what I always, I know it seems so difficult at first, but I'm telling you the more and more you practice, it's actually going to sound better Plus, I tell people, if you're writing every single word down, not only are you going to sound like a robot, but typically you need more equipment. You need a teleprompter. You need a better camera that can go through the teleprompter. Like there's so many different nuances when you start to script every single word. And I promise you, most of the time, just pretend like you're talking to a friend, pretend like you're on FaceTime with somebody and that's going to sound more conversational, more natural. So I actually don't like scripting every word. Sometimes I'll have those talking points. I know I need to touch on this but I hardly read word for word, hardly ever, unless I'm doing like an ad or something. Most people do not know how to, uh, most people don't write the way they speak. And that's the other side of it that can trip you up, right? Because yes. people often write in a way that for whatever reason, maybe they were trained that way in school, that sounds not quite as, um, it's drier. You know what I mean? It's not as flexible and you don't allow yourself to have the mistakes and the ums and ahs in there, which show more the authentic you, right? And when you're on the fly, you speak in a different way than when you write, because when you write, you try to aim for perfection. So I love the idea that you tend to recommend unscripted and simple little bullets. Um, if you know that you're going to be creating a YouTube video and you know that TikToks and Reels and Shorts are vertical video, anything people need to keep in mind when they're filming so they can actually crop it vertically? Absolutely. Yeah. I am a huge fan of the less equipment, the better. So I actually set up, I just have a Sony ZV-1 for anybody who's curious. It's a small little point and shoot, fairly affordable, um, but you can use anything at your disposal. If you have an iPhone, use it. The biggest thing that I tell people is always making sure you have room to both sides of you and a little room above your head and a little room below your head. So that that way, when you crop it in, in post-production, you're able to do so much more with that video content. So just giving yourself some room, that's the biggest thing. Thing and just kind of being aware that it is going to be a little bit tighter when you crop it in, but that's it, that's pretty much all it takes. Okay. So the first step of your process we've digged in pretty deep on, which is batch record a whole bunch of these different things and break them into segments with three different segments that you can intentionally create into three separate pieces of content. Yes. What's the next part of the process? 
So the next part of the process, I really start to prep my content for repurposing. So in full transparency, I will let people know I do have a person on my team to kind of help me with this process. So if you are a solo marketer, if you're a small business owner, whether you keep this in-house, whether you delegate, totally up to you. The reason why I have somebody on my team is because I produce so much content, but I just want to give the caveat that you can totally do this on your own. The first part of the process is actually editing that video. And I like to use uh, something called Descript, but feel free to use any editing software that you like. I keep it very simple. I don't do crazy fancy edits. I literally only cut out my pauses. Uh, Sometimes I'll put text on the screen if I really want to emphasize a point. Sometimes there might be B-roll or GIFs or fun things, but again, few and far between. I'm not doing complex editing. It takes maybe 15 to 20 minutes to edit each video. We keep it simple. And especially with Descript, there's a lot of tools in there um, that use AI to help us facilitate cutting out the ums, the ahs, the pauses for us. So it's not like we're manually doing a ton of stuff. So that's the first Let's, let's talk about Descript, yeah. if you don't mind. Absolutely. Just um, so Descript is a, um, well, I was, I know it mostly as a podcasting tool. I think that's how they first got their start, right? But yes. they, they use AI to um, allow you to kind of edit like you're in a document, right? And you yes. see your, your text there and you just cut the stuff you don't want and it just cuts it for you, right? I mean, like, what else can it do? Um, can it do the on-screen captions and stuff if you want that? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, it's a very, very powerful tool and they're always introducing new things. But yeah, the main focus of Descript, it did start as a podcasting uh, tool, but now they have also introduced video. But the main thing is, yes, you get to er- edit it like a Word document. So let's say I say something X, Y, and Z. I can literally highlight X, Y, and Z, click the delete button, and it removes it from my video. So again, you're not doing this like weird splicing thing and trying to figure out where to crop things and trim things. You literally highlight it, delete it. And it has made the editing process so much faster. Like if you're using CapCut or Premiere Pro, you're having to do that manually, you know? So it's just, again, another way. They also have, I can't exactly remember what, it's like just their new AI tool. And it's up in like the top right-hand corner, you click it and it says, remove filler words or or if there's a pause greater than 0.5 seconds, shrink it down to 0.25 seconds. Like there's all these things that you can do that do the editing for you too, which is so, so fantastic. And yes, you can add the captions. You literally highlight what you want to have captions on it, you know, uh, text on screen, and you literally click the caption button and that's it. And it does it for you. You're not manually doing anything. For those that happen to have Vimeo accounts, uh, they recently rolled out AI tools that do something very similar, uh, which is really cool. The, the idea of automatically removing all those awkward pauses and ums and ahs and stuff like that. So, all right. So this prepping for repurposing, stage one is to edit it, right? And it, it sounds like it's mostly just removing stuff that doesn't matter. Do you also get rid of the breaths and stuff like that? Or what's your thoughts on that? Not too much. If I take, because as I'm recording, I let the camera roll. So again, I'm letting it roll for 20 minutes. And again, it probably condenses into a 12 to uh, eight to 12 minute video. So yeah, I do remove, like if I'm pausing, I call it the millennial pause. It's a very well-known term. Like if it's longer than a second, yes, it needs to get cut down. We're, we have very short attention spans. And if somebody's just staring at the screen and watching your YouTube video and you're just staring back, it, it doesn't feel good. It's not good for your watch times and for the user audience experience. So yeah, Yes, I do tend to cut those down, but I like to naturally keep in some of my pauses or I make weird faces or do funny things. Yeah, I was curious about that. In. In, yeah. Even your snafus and stuff, because it just adds a little bit of authenticity to the longer videos, right? Correct. Yeah. Or if it's like sometimes I'll misspeak or throw something in there and I was like, you know, sometimes I'll just leave it in. It's fine. It keeps me natural and human and adds to the experience. And again, my brand is a little bit more uh, on the sassier side. So I don't mind keeping that stuff in. If you have more of a professional brand or you're marketing for a brand, I understand why you'd want to cut those out. But I personally like to leave that stuff in. Okay. So what else do we need to be thinking about when it comes to this preparing for the repurposing? Yeah. So basically that's it. That's the foundation. That's the start of your repurposing process. You need to cut down, perfect that long form piece of content that will get posted for you. Now, the next part of the process, again, why I love to lean into a tool like Descript, 
I now have, since it's already a Word document that's transcript that has a transcript for me, I can take that transcript. Those are my words. Those are that's my voice, and it is going to make other pieces of content sound so much more authentic. Because you already brought it up, people tend to write a bit more professionally or try to write perfectly, and it comes across in their content. And I'm like, that doesn't even sound like you. That doesn't sound authentically like you. So now I take that entire transcript and we break it down into other pieces of content. Again, with Descript, we can highlight, let's let's say I have a 30 second real idea. Loved what I said in this section of the video. I highlight it. I right click and say, create new video. It pulls that part of the video out for me and creates a new vertical composition. Again, like we really need to lean into some of these AI tools. And now I have a reel. Now I have a TikTok. I can take that same clip of that YouTube video, throw it into an AI tool like ChatGPT, Claude, things like that. Hey, rewrite this for me. And now it's an Instagram caption, things like that. So we basically take that transcript and do as much with it as we can, because those are my words. It's my thought. And that's where I love to lean into AI tools. I love to lean into my content manager to help me produce more content from that main piece of long form video. Okay, so some people who are fairly uh, good at math are probably doing the math on this, saying, okay, well, if your average video is like eight to 10 minutes long and the average reel is like 30 to 60 seconds and you got three sections, you're clearly having to scrap a whole bunch of stuff you're talking about. Do you have any thoughts on how to how to optimize that for like a shorter piece of content? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, there are certain things... You need to have, when I'm creating that long form YouTube video, I'm not going to use every single word that I say. Context is a big thing with the YouTube video. And knowing that when you go in to create this long form piece of content, somebody is there for the duration of your content. Most of the time, we hope so. Um, you know, so obviously I tell backstories and there's other pieces of context. Whereas when I'm clipping down for short form videos out of an eight to 10 minute YouTube video, I aim to get three to six short form videos from that. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't, I'm not going to use every single thing I say. It won't make sense when pulled out of the YouTube video, but those key gems, those key hidden little pockets of information that I know are going to perform so well as a short form video, I pulled those parts out. So again, I don't want you to think you can take this 10 minute long YouTube video and create 30 pieces of content. It's just not going to make sense. But yeah, I like to lean into thinking like, okay, if I can get three to six short form videos for this, that's golden right there. So um, for those of us that might be doing this ourselves or, or training someone else to do this for us, that's on our team. How do we know um, if we got a 10 minute video uh, and we want to get at least three clips out of it, are you aiming for shorter clips or are you going more for 60 seconds? Like what's the length? And are, are you also combining different sections together to create kind of one video? Do you understand what I'm asking? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, my, my, my end goal here is I try and keep my short form videos 15 seconds to 60 seconds just to play nice with all the platforms that typically works. Like I can throw a 60 second video on YouTube shorts. Um, you know, when you start getting past that 60 second point, it gets a little bit more difficult reposting in certain places. So I aim for 15 to uh, 60 seconds. Now I always go in again, let's go back to that outline, that framework. I have three main talking points. That's three videos right there. I already know I'm going to post, um, you know, I pull out the main subject of that talking point. And those are each, that's three videos right there. Now for the other, if I can get more content out of it, yes, I will. With Descript, sometimes I will pull out, uh, you know, each of those three points and shove it together in one video. So it's like the video might look something like, Hey, don't get scammed by social media experts. Here are the three things you need to know. And I'll pull out three different talking points and then I list them out on the video. That might be more of a 60 to 90 second video that I'll post only on reels and TikTok. Um, you know, so yes, sometimes I combine different parts of the video. I try and keep it easy though. And I don't lean into those as much because again, they do take more editing time. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of what I lean into the most. So if we have three sections and we wanted to make two videos out of each section, what's your thoughts on making a short version of it and a slightly longer version of it and experimenting with it? Does that work? Do you get penalized by the platforms if you have a 15 second version and a 60 second version and you want to kind of test which one performs better? I say go for it. I know that I've tested certain things with my audience and I 
10, my sweet spot is that 30 second mark. So I kind of, that's why I always say like a 15 to 60 second and 30 seconds is right in the middle. That's what I know works for my audience. But if you're just starting on this journey, absolutely test out that 15 second video and then do like a 90 second video, both on Instagram. Maybe you use a different real cover. Maybe you use different visuals or graphics to accompany it, to make it feel a little bit different, or you just post the same thing. I recently did this where I took like a 20 second clip from a YouTube video. I posted that one day, like on a Tuesday. The next day I ripped just the audio from it and put it on a reel with B-roll in the background of just the captions and just my voice. The same exact segment of the YouTube video, two different visuals, but the exact same audio. So I was testing out new things. So that's another way that I like to lean into this repurposing Ooh, is like, like testing that. out stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because the... My, I, for those of you that are watching right now, uh, Amber said is a very basic, uh, you're in a room. Is this where you normally do all of your recording? Yep. She's, she's in a, a room that's probably her home office or something like that, right? Yep. And I like the idea of possibly throwing B-roll in there as one experiment, right? Where you could be showing off what you're talking about with some screen captures and stuff like that and see whether that performs better than just a talking head, right? Absolutely. And yeah, so again, test out these new things. And that's where I like to say, I know I'm going to get three talking head videos. I know I will get that out of my YouTube video. And that will carry me through the week on Instagram, carry me through the week on TikTok. Anything else I get after that, if I want to experiment with the B-roll, if I want to experiment with just ripping the audio for an Instagram story, I can take that same thing that I said and create a thread on, you know, on Instagram threads for that. So it's just playing around with it. But again, that's why I always tell entrepreneurs, small business owners, solo marketers, you know, start with the basics, start with the foundation, but then you get to experiment. And that's the joy of this repurposing is you get to be more creative with the end result while also saving time. Let's go back to the written word from the video. Um, yes. Talk to me about what's possible here, because I can imagine a million possibilities here, right? Absolutely. So this is the part of the process that I've recently been playing around with because in the beginning, I would have this full transcript and manually myself and my content manager, we would take that full transcript, break it down into a newsletter, a blog post, Instagram captions, things like that. And yes, you can do it manually. And yes, it still does save you time. But again, it is still a manual time intensive process. Recently, what I like to do is I will take that full transcript. And again, keeping in mind that these are my words, these are my thoughts, these are my ideas. I can now take that into an AI tool and say, hey, can you generate a quick outline based on what I said in this transcript for a newsletter that I can send to my email uh, subscribers? And in that, it saves you so much time. It condenses all that information that you have in that transcript into something that you can develop into a newsletter for your email list. You can develop it into a blog post. I know you kind of do something very similar for this exact podcast so that you're tapping into other digital marketing areas, other content creation spaces, and showing up in more places. Well, what tools are you using currently? Because I'll talk about what tools I'm using. I'm, I think we're not using the exact same tools. Maybe. Yeah. So initially I was using ChatGPT and I think actually you recommended Claude to me and I've been playing around with Claude and let me tell you what, it is at least awesome? for now far superior than ChatGPT. I've noticed giving, given the same input, um, Claude gives far better output. It sounds way more like you, whereas I feel like ChatGPT it is a robot trying to sound like a human, whereas Claude takes your tone and your voice and they spit out something way better. So I've been loving Claude lately. Yeah, Claude.ai, for those that don't uh, know, and there's a free version of both ChatGPT and Claude, and there's a paid version of both. And I think they're both about $20 a month. Um, with Claude, you will eventually hit a, a limit and then you might have to do the paid version. But we've been blown away with Claude. What's great about Claude is you can attach that file as a file, if you have a written file and it will just work off that file, which is beautiful. Yeah. Now, um, I would imagine we could go the opposite direction. Well, a couple thoughts here. Um, I'm a writer and a video creator and I write every week, original written content and original video content. And, um, and I also do this podcast, which I guess is audio, uh, mostly video audio. Uh, so, what I'm experimenting with is I find that I'm actually a much um, better writer than I am a video person. And I write some really interesting content and I watch to see what performs really well. And I would imagine I could use that as inspiration 
to do this process on video. And I could probably flip the script and also do written content from a well-performing video because uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, threads to a lesser extent, because there's a real short character limit, and Facebook are all really, for the most part, they'll accept long form written content without any problems. And I have found, like you said, there's some people that are in a position where they can't watch a video because they're out and about, but they'll read something. So um, I would imagine we could flip this in both directions. We could start with the written word, see what performs well, and then use it as the inspiration for video or multiple written pieces of content, right? Yeah, absolutely. And again, this is lean into your strengths. I obviously gave the example of YouTube videos, but I've taught plenty of people who prefer to write articles, prefer to write blogs, or they have an audio podcast. And I'm like, we can still do so much and you can still repurpose. The whole point is to use what's in your arsenal, use what your strength is, and then figure out ways to deliver and continue to repurpose. So for your example, you love to write more long form written content drop it into Claude and say, hey, can you condense this and create a script I can read for a, a TikTok video? There Something like that. So again, you guys just use these tools and it's just going to get you into the mindset. If you struggle more with video, it at least gives you a framework and an approach to test things until you feel confident, until you feel comfortable while still delivering the same message that you want to deliver. Okay. Crazy question. Thumbnails. Um, are you using AI for thumbnails or do you have someone doing that for you? Or is there any kind of thoughts on that? Yeah. So currently I literally just, we create our thumbnails in Canva and then AB test them through uh, TubeBuddy, but that's it. And that is something that I am going to start exploring more in the new year is like playing around with the thumbnail thing. For me right now, it, I don't have a large enough of a channel where I think it matters that much, but as I continue to grow, I think, you know, I think giving an example, Mr. Beast spends like 10 hours just on the thumbnail. And I'm like, I don't think I ever want to get that crazy, but I think there is an approach to it. But for me, I'm like, Hey, get your content out there because content posted is better than content that you're going to try and perfect over time. For those that want to understand how to use AI to do cool stuff with YouTube, uh, Matt Wolf was on the show a while back and we talked about his whole process of using AI from everything from his newsletter to his thumbnails. We use, um, Adobe Firefox, which is free for anybody who has an Adobe license. And they just updated it as of this recording last week because they just had their big conference. And it's ridiculously good to create really cool uh, thematic backgrounds that you can put text over. And uh, we also use TubeBuddy for, for thumbnail testing. And I will tell you, it doesn't matter how big your channel is because each video is like it's a standalone thing. Yes. And you'd be surprised how a slight change in the thumbnail can dramatically increase your likelihood that's, that people are going to see those videos. Absolutely. So, okay, let's talk about the last part of your content, yes. uh, strategy. Yes. Yeah, so this is one, we'll keep it short and simple, but it is the one I always have to hit home to uh, marketing teams, small business owners, entrepreneurs, is that you create all this content. Great, we did all this stuff. Now you actually have to get it posted. And the part about this content repurposing strategy and structure, you're going to produce a lot more content than you typically would if you were posting in the moment or if you were posting manually. So I am a huge fan of leaning into scheduling tools. My preferred one is the one that's easiest for you to use. Um, I obviously love later. I'm looking into some more robust ones or leaning into the native scheduling tools inside the apps. Like I still use YouTube Studio to schedule out my YouTube videos. I'm not using anything crazy, but basically I just want you guys to step away from social media. I, yes, I know. I'm a content strategist and I want to tell you to get off these apps. So I want you to make sure that you take all this content and again, it leans into batching, sit down and schedule it all at once. You're done for the week. You're done for the next two weeks. You're done for the next month, whatever works for you. Because so often we get into this like, oh, what if it's not ready? What if I don't want to post it? Or you get that notification on your phone. It's time to post today. I don't feel like it. Lean into these scheduling tools to make sure the content actually gets posted. It's interesting because I was at a conference in Boston in a hotel with a really crappy Wi-Fi. And I was trying to download these massive gigabyte files to uh, upload to Instagram and all the other platforms. Uh, Twitter slash X. And I just it was taking forever. So I had to wait till I got back to my house on Saturday to actually do it. And I have found some of these social tools have made it harder. Like I know Twitter has made it harder for you to schedule using third party tools. And I think some of these tools like Instagram, you can only schedule if you have like a business professional account or something. Is that right? 
Yes. And that's so that's the hard part. And again, while I always like to tell people it, the professional account's worth it <laughs> kind of thing, especially yeah. like when you some some scheduling tools don't allow you to schedule and auto publish reels. But if you have that business account, you can schedule reels within the app with trending audio. That's what I like to tell people. And I'm like, because especially it's a big question I get. What if I want to use a trending audio? What if I want to use? I'm like, you can do it all inside of Instagram if you have that business account. So yes, that is another component of it. But I always recommend, hey, you guys need to, to just jump ship and make sure you have the business account. Question on Instagram. Can you upload a draft and does it save it into Instagram? Like up in the cloud or, or like, is that not how it works natively inside of Instagram? So if you want to save a draft inside of Instagram, it's actually stored locally on your phone. That's why, yeah. So if there's a glitch- Upload a big file potentially, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's like, if you have a draft saved inside of your Instagram reels, let's just say it is actually locally stored on your phones. That's why I tell you, if you delete the app, all of that's going to be gone. So it's like, you, you know, there's no like cloud storage for the Instagram drafts. Um, but yeah, so just make sure you can save it there. But if you delete the app, just know it's going to be gone. <laughs> Amber, this has been really fascinating. If people want to um, connect with you on the socials, what's your preferred social platform? And if they want to discover more about you and your company, where would you like to send them? Yeah, absolutely. So if you're wanting to learn and dive really deep into some of these strategies that I've taught today, YouTube is like the best place to go to learn a lot more. If you want to have a one-on-one -on -one connection with me, Instagram is the place to go. And I'm Amber Figlow over on Instagram. So you guys can just hit me up in the DMs. I love having conversations there. Leave me a comment on some of the, the content, but I post so much free stuff that I promise you, you guys can start running with this strategy. And if you want to learn more, uh, you guys can find me at amberfiglow.com forward slash SME. And then we We'll make sure to have some goodies for you. And again, they'll be in the show notes. I'm sure perfect. I'll make sure you guys have the yeah, URL. That'll stand for Social Media Examiner. Yeah, and Perfect. Everything. Now on YouTube, how do they find you on YouTube? Just Amber Figlow. That's my channel. Yep. Find awesome. me there. Okay. So amberfiglow.com slash SME is the place to go to. Amber, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your insights with us. We're so much better because of it. Yes. Thank you so much. It was so much fun.